testimony this morning at um, my ladies group, the ladies house where we meet, she and I did Bible release in our local school for a number of years, eight, nine, ten, something like that, and we taught the kids how to pray for each other to be healed. Well, I didn't do it this year, but she had a mom who's not a believer, um, contact her and say one of the kids one of the young men that we had been uh, that we had done together that was in our group and had learned how to pray he came home from school last week and found out his mother had a horribly sprained ankle and he immediately went over and put his hand on her ankle prayed for her and she got healed <laughs> kids are like 8 years old <laughs> cool. anybody else? that's I'll try to make it quick. Try to make it quick. I'll just yank the mic out of your hand. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just I'll just yank the mic. Cool. Okay, I'm a little shaky. I just got back from four days at Bethel Church. <laughs> but it was all good. Uh, they, I've been helping for years and helped start the course in Bethel Global Disaster Response. Yeah. And uh, so Ron Berry, Kim Berry, and I went down uh, as first responders to help teach. They decided... Bill Johnson decided about a year ago that these classes were important to everybody and we have so many foreign students they could take this information back to their countries and stuff and in the country of Texas and yeah. really you know be effective responders uh, in their own community so Bill Johnson decided all first year all students had to go through this course and our, typically our classes prior to this had been like 40 students. So now we had four days to train 2,000 students. So we had classrooms now that are 150 to 200 students per session. So we started out Thursday afternoon about 4.30. Friday morning we started at uh, 8.30 and we quit at 6.30 at night. Saturday morning, same thing. So. Anyway, we got through it, and the students are excited and want to be deployed, so we sent some down to Orville and Chico, because they had 200,000 refugees there, and so they just went to the Salvation Army and the Red Cross shelters and prayed for people and, and tried to make connections to make sure that, that they had, their needs were met, like their pets were being taken care of and you know all those things. Two hundred thousand people they ministered to down there. Wow, all right. So wow. that was that was a good uh, deployment. <laughs> anyway, uh, 
Yeah. Bethel Global Response. Amazing organization. We went to Africa last year, and Ron and Kim went to North Carolina for that deal. And so it's good stuff. It's not just school. It's not just hitting people overhead with a Bible. Thank you. We do that. Uh, okay. Can I give it to Yes, you may. Hold on. Let me get to my camera. Can you come stand right here so our little camera sure. can find you? Right. Well, I just wanted to thank everybody who had prayed for me and who um, had me in your heart while I was fighting cancer. And I just wanted to let you know that I'm up to two miles walking when I get a chance to get up Yay. there. Yeah. And that's a, against wind gusts. So, you know. <laughs> You're pretty small. That's a, that's a lot of wind. Yeah, come on up. Resistance training. Stand right there. Right there. Just going to knock my tea out of my face. Okay. Um, I, uh, I, a couple months ago, I asked uh, during uh, one of the one of our Tuesday nights for people to pray for uh, some of the men in our prison that have been dealing with schizophrenia, and I want to thank any of you that that have uh, been doing that. We have um, about four or five guys that come in on Sunday nights that have been battling with with the schizophrenia and. They can't read. It makes it really complicated for them to read or um, read the Bible or do any lots of activities, and they have to be medicated all the time. And uh, so I've been praying for them, and I uh, and I will uh, solicit more prayers for them if you guys feel in, any of you intercessors out there that would like to uh, join me in these prayers. But. Uh, We've had some remarkable changes with uh, three of the guys. They can actually, they're reading their Bibles every day, um, and they're coming every Sunday night, and they're participating. They're not just sitting there, you know, and so it's uh, it's just been a, a, a remarkable change in that time. So I just want to thank you guys and ask you to continue if you're helping me out. <laughs> Got any more we can say before later we get moving? So, look at the cells up here tonight. The cell trio. Yay. So, let's just put her. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know. That. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <There. laughs> All right. It starts on me. It's always one. Okay, so let's just uh, prepare our hearts for worship right now. So, Lord, we just invite you into this place, Holy Spirit our hearts right now for uh, just to worship you Lord God and celebrate you Lord yeah we just welcome you here and we just uh, just close our minds off to anything out there that we drug in that's weighing us down this evening Lord God I just pray ask that you would just like make this place a sanctuary Lord God where we can just let those things go to you and just enjoy your presence and Lord it's still around amen
It is a natural. You know what Dom that is? I think it's good. I'll just hold it closer to my face. Is it good? Yeah. Just ruined my moments, my tender moments. Ah, uh, anyway. Holy Spirit. Sorry for the awkward moment, Holy Spirit. Um, yeah, we do love your presence, Lord. And, um, yeah, it's just a privilege and an honor to worship you, Jesus, tonight. And, yeah, I just want to pray for everybody that's ears in here, that they just have ears to hear tonight, Lord, it's on your heart. I think it's very important. Thank you for the cells and the Taylor. <laughs> uh, thanks, guys. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, like I said, uh, those who just got here, Ron and Donna, are away. They were in. Where were they at? Guadalajara. <laughs> Somewhere that way, south, 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 southeast. I don't know. Somewhere that I don't know. Yeah. It's warm. Yeah. I actually didn't even go there. Um. Yeah. So they just, or they should be on their way here. Actually, right now, I think they're in Seattle. So maybe, maybe it's a little early for them to fly out. But they're going to be getting in late. And I got to take off and go to Reading tomorrow. So we're all over the place. But um, yeah. Was there anyone that got anything during worship they felt like was relevant for tonight? I know Steve's got a word. I can see it. We got a little drawing, maybe? Alright, let's go through the drawings and then we'll do the words. Alright, come over here close to me. I got my little sensor on. Alright. Oh, let me have your phone. Oh, this way? Okay. That's where it is. What is it? It's a door, and like right here, it's like a little center right there. Um, God want, uh, told me to tell you that there's always going to be an open door. Put that on the microphone, then we're there. You the go, that's good. Goes. I was thinking. Um, well, I scratched on a few things, so I'm going to go out on the limb. Um, I got the name Frank. Is there a Frank here? No. Is your birthday in April? No. Okay. Missed it. Um, are you dealing with some issues with your shoulders? Maybe it's a different Frank. I don't know. Somebody well. What's that? Yeah, it could be. Uh, what I what I wrote down was, Frank, I thought it was an April birthday, maybe the 21st, not sure. Um, it's about a health issue. I, had, I think it had to do with shoulders, something that was just diagnosed. And, um, <clears throat> and it's been really causing you a lot of hopelessness, and you've been really down as a result of it, sort of been discouraged. And you're supposed to get your hope back. And... Um, uh, because this has been discouraging you and it's really hindered you and he wants to restore your hope about this and know that it's going to get a whole lot better. So that's what I wrote down. 
Anybody in here not named Frank? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that is kind of Frank. <laughs> Frank. Frank. No, the, only other, the only other thing I wrote down, I'm not sure about it, maybe an Eric October birthday, kind of a wrist issue. My, I, my dad's birthday is in October, and his it's, name's Eric. Really? Does he have a... I have a wrist issue. You have a wrist issue. <laughs> did, um, did it happen from a fall or an accident or something? Um, no, just from my body being really fatigued and weak. Okay. Just doing activities caused my weakness. Okay, well, you know what to do. We just pray <laughs> for her. Pray for that one. And pray for her. So, Lord, we pray for her that uh, this wrist issue gets healed up and uh, it goes away completely. And that you just totally do it because you can do that. And if there's a Frank out there with shoulder issues, Lord, touch him and give him hope. Yeah. Yeah. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Cool. Right on. Anybody else? Earth shattering. I don't have any earth shattering. No, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just How about earth healing? We'll take some earth healing. But it's good. But you got to stand next to it. So well, I would. Oh, I do? Okay. Yeah, I've got my little thing in. Oh, okay. Can I? Can no, you're fine. Okay. okay, so I came in here like a whirlwind, and Amy goes, whoa. <laughs> I'm standing there, and she's going, are you Okay. She goes, you know, I'm feeling something from you. And I just want to thank her and also just apologize. You know, sometimes we come into the body thinking, you know, we're just going to come in here as is. And I should have just kind of checked myself at the door and went, you know, and not bring my own stuff into the room because there are sensitive ones in here feeling it. And so I want to admonish and encourage everybody here that we are family and we all feel each other's ups and downs. And I had just had a busy day and I just kind of, came in and there I stood and Amy goes, hey, anyways, so, so she helped me connect, you know, like that instead it probably would have taken me 10 minutes, but, you know, her faithfulness to be my friend helped me to connect, you know, to the Father very quickly. So thank you, Amy. Love you. <laughs> cool. All right. I see some comments online. The mics, it's hard to hear when somebody else has it because I have the mic that you're hearing online. So hopefully that's fixed now. If it's not, tell me. I got my little robot over there following me. So I know you want to watch that. But, yeah. My eyes are right here. Okay, so I'm going to pray for me really quick. Lord, help me be articulate tonight. Amen. Yeah. Oh, and the offering, Lord. We pray for that as well. Fill it full of stuff. I hear the word of the Lord. Empty your wallet. Preferably green stuff. Or gold. Or, or gold stuff. Copper. Alright. Smiley people. Okay. <laughs> I'm in a super weird mood today, so you guys are going to get, I don't know what you're going to get, I don't even know what I'm going to say. I've had the weirdest week. So I'm, some of you know I've been having like some health stuff, I've got all these like food sensitivities, I've discovered that if it's an allergy it'll actually kill you, so apparently I have food sensitivities. And according to the blood test I take, they always change, so I never know what I get to eat from week to week, so. But I'm healing really well, so I'm doing good. Thanks yeah, for all the prayers. Hallelujah. I'm stronger, got to put weight back on, and I'm feeling strong enough for me to be happy, so I'm feeling good, so. And I can eat some stuff that I couldn't eat, like eggs and beef. Yay! Yay. 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 There is no cow safe for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's grass fed. Yes. All the mutant cows, you can have them. <laughs> you can have all those three-eyed... Cows. <laughs> yeah, so I don't want any of those. Any of those. So, um, yeah, so this is like, uh, I've funny because what I'm talking about tonight, I felt like I've talked about because I've it's been living it for like months and and I was like, didn't I just, didn't I already talk about this? But I guess I didn't because apparently <laughs> I've just been talking about it a lot. And uh, so uh, my message tonight is, is um, Guarding ourselves against um, guarding ourselves uh, against a spirit of godliness with no power, or a form of godliness with no power. Um, that's the name, the, the name of my message tonight. My alternate name was Jehu Kazuntite. 
<laughs> Why do you think you're good? <laughs> because anytime, God bless you. And Jay, who's in my message, so. I, uh, it was funnier at home when I was right. I was <laughs> listening to Andy's metal for some reason. That was my my background theme for all these. It's like, why do I have to listen to 80s metal? It's what was working. It's like, try, I should listen to worship and then get in the zone. It's like, no, I need to listen to Cinderella. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to read a, a verse to you to start out. And it's uh, 2 Timothy, Timothy 3, 5. It says, in the last days, men will, and it names off a whole bunch of terrible things they'll do, but one of them I want to focus on is have the form of godliness but deny its power. The Weymouth uh, New Testament translation says, in the last days, the men will keep up a make-believe of piety and yet be in defiance of its power. Which is a little more accurate, I think, of kind of where I'm going, yeah. So I want to tell you the story about... Um, King Jehu. You guys know who Jehu was in the Bible? Yeah. Yep. What did we talk about last time? We talked about Hezekiah, didn't we? And how he dismantled the um, all the altars and the snake of God and all that stuff. Yeah, okay, I guess. I do remember what I talked about last time. So we're kind of further along in the story now, I think. <laughs> Maybe we're farther back. We're somewhere in there in 2 Kings. But um, so Jehu uh, was a king anointed by the Lord. Uh, basically to destroy the house of uh, Jezebel and Ahab um, and um, all their descendants. And it's kind of a funny story. The way he was anointed, like, Elijah just like, all right, he picks a prophet out of his company. He's like, I want you to go run up to Jehu and, like, like call him aside, dump oil on his head, say, you are king, and take off running. And so that's what he does. He's, like, hanging out with his buddies, and this guy's like, hey, I got something to tell you. And he's like, all right, what are you going to tell me? He just dumps oil on his head, and he's like, you are king, and he takes off running. He's like, what? He goes out and tells his buddy, he's like, what did that guy want? He's like, oh, you know, those weird prophet people. And he's like, no, we don't. Tell him what he said. And he said, oh, he said I was king of Israel. And they just fell at his feet and threw out their, I mean, the power. I literally think the power of, like, you know, God's united life. They threw out their robes or whatever, their cloaks, and said, hail the king. So he went after um, the house of Ahab in force. Like, he was scary. Like, people would come out. They'd see his army coming. They'd come out and be like, is this guy, what's he doing? Is he for us? Is he an enemy? And they'd come out and say, they'd send out messengers, and they'd be like, uh, are you coming in peace? And he's like, do I look like I'm coming in peace? You may want to die or fall behind me. So it was literally just like everyone was falling behind him, and he inevitably ended up at um, Jezebel's house. You know the story. He's like, all right, who's with me? Some of her people up there was like, <coughs> pitched her off the, the edge of the window, and the dogs ate her blood. And it's all gory and awesome. <laughs> um, gory and awesome. <laughs> The Lord loved Jezebel, too. I know people don't like to think that, but he did. But she met a faithful end because of her choices. And so then he systematically went and he killed all of Ahab's uh, descendants and their friends and all the prophets of Baal, or Baal, as people often call it. But I think it's like Baal or something like that. But we can say Baal for tonight. Um, and so he did what he was supposed to do with force. Like he had the anointing to do that, and he did it. And so, like, toward the end, the Lord said, you know, congratulations, you did what I wanted to do, but whatever, however, he did not turn away from the sin of Jeroboam. You know what that is? What the sin of Jeroboam was? No. Don't you read your Bibles? No, I didn't even know until you story. Sneeze. It's always like the cutest sneeze ever. It's like a cat. I thought there was a cat in here. <laughs> it's always singular. Okay, so what the sin of Jeroboam was, um, uh, was the golden calf religion, or the worship of the golden calves. Are you guys familiar with that at all? Good, I'm going to tell you what it is. So, I'm going to read this next part. So, Basically, we're in 1 Kings 12, somewhere in there, 26 to 30 ish. Um, yeah, 1 Kings 12, 26 to 30. So Jeroboam, son of Nebat, became king of Israel by popular demand. And Jeroboam thought if these people go up and offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord of Jerusalem, the kingdom will likely revert back to the house of David. So, after seeking advice from some of his shady counselors, that's not it, right? Maybe shady counselors. Um, the king made two golden calves 
And he said to the people, It's too much for you to travel all the way to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. He set one up in Bethel and one up in Dan. Not Bethel and Redding. Different. <laughs> Um, and he established new temples, and he appoints non-Levitical priests to serve at the altar of Bethel. And this thing became a sin. The people came to worship the one at Bethel, and went as far to Dan to worship the other. Um, so it's thought that he was trying to replicate the cherubim of Solomon's temple. So they were they were like a replica of like where they would imagine that God was seated, or like pedestals upon which the Lord would stand, invisible to the human eye, basically. So they were a picture of the throne, if you will, right? Kind of, uh, it was something that God had, you know, it was good at one point, but they just made a replica of it and put it somewhere else and began to worship the replica. What else does that remind you of? Remember the snake thing that I thought about? Yeah. That they, God told Moses to put up the snake, you know, for a reason, that they looked upon it, they'd be healed. But later that thing turned into a cult because the people just kept going there and worshiping the snake. And it spun off into a religion and it had to be um, eradicated later. So it's kind of the same thing. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Um, what he had created basically was a form of godliness with no power. He, he made like a, a replica, like a, uh, a false version of what the Lord had commanded. You know, he will come and, and worship me at this temple. But he'd set something else, else up. And his sales pitch was like, that's just too far, you know. <laughs> Why don't you come here and... And worship right here. It's easy, you know, worship here. So, um, you know, I was thinking about that. It's funny that, you know, the man who strives for an appearance of godliness, godliness has a funny habit of trying to make a throne for God to sit on <laughs> with his hands, you know. It's like, oh, we made this thing. Why don't you sit here, God? This is what we're doing. Why don't you sit there and do what we're doing? And uh, we've got Sunday school and a bake sale coming up. And if you would just do what we're doing, it would be great, you know? And um, But God's like, I'm not sitting where you're sitting. I want to be seated in your heart, right? Yeah. So then they wonder why things don't work. <laughs> so, it's, again, it's a form of godliness with no power, you know? And Holy Spirit just always moves like the wind, right? So it's imperative to have a relationship with the person the Holy Spirit. Or we'll end up, you know, like... I was thinking of an example, like, what if, you know, you know when Jesus, like, I might get off a tangent, you know when Jesus, like, spit on the ground and, like, stuck it in the guy's eye and healed his blindness? Remember that? What if, like, every time we tried to heal someone's blindness, we spit on the ground and, like, stuck their mud in their eye? I mean, so literally, sometimes that's where the church has gone. Like, they see God do something once, because yeah. yeah. cause at the time, that's what the Lord said to do. And so in this moment, I want you to spit on the ground and put mud in that guy's eyes. Uh, but then they just keep doing it. It's like, oh, this worked that time. I don't want to hear God in the next moment. I'm just keep spitting on the ground and sticking mud in people's eyes because that's what happened last time, right? So it's not having a relationship with the Lord. It's just replicating and copying something that we saw. Form of godliness with no power, right? You guys tracking with me? Yeah. Okay. So like I said, the golden calf started out as God's idea, but it became an idol, you know, an, an image of man telling God where to sit. And it was really a religion formed out of motiv you know, motivated by control, fear and like political motivation and um, it just wasn't a good thing. So why am I talking about that? Because we've been dealing with this spirit lately <laughs> that's trying to establish the same thing in this region, in this movement that we're doing, in this new thing that God's doing. And um, um, we talk about the religious spirit a lot. Everyone's familiar with that. Everyone loves to hate on the religious spirit. You know, religion, the Lord said, that is pure is not bad, you know. But a religious spirit is something different, you know. And, um, but there's also a false Holy Spirit, like a false spirit of prophecy that's been running around pretty rampant as well. But it's the same spirit. It's the same spirit. The spirit of religion and the spirit of false prophecy is literally the same spirit. It's the spirit that tries to establish a form of godliness with no power. And it's been doing it forever. And unfortunately, that's the way a lot of churches operate. It's just in a form of godliness with no power. A lot of religions are operating under a form of godliness with no power. And I really feel like that's a lot of the reasons why the, the, the Protestant movement, were like, yeah, a lot of them are like, you know, miracles aren't for today, like the tongues thing, whatever. They don't believe anything in the spirit because they don't, they've never seen it manifest. Mm -hmm. 
because they're not trying for a relationship that where they would see that manifest, they're just trying to follow the rules to make a, you know, follow something man-made, a system that they put in place and like, oh, we see the stuff in the Word, we don't know why it's not working, that must not be for us. It's a form of godliness with no power. Um, yeah. This has like been a hard thing for me to actually write all my notes. I just made this, this spirit makes me so mad. I get furious. Like there's like a lot of anger in my notes. I'm like I hate this thing. I hate you. <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm listening to metal all day. <laughs> but um, so it's kind of a shape shifter, and it shows up in different ways. Um, um, but it always has the same agenda. It always has the same agenda. And it's the false, right? So it hates the real. And so what I'm going to do is kind of like, I feel like I need to like educate you guys on what's been going on in the background, what we've been picking up in the spirit, and um, what this looks like so you guys can like be on the lookout for it. And if you even, maybe even recognize it in your own life, you know, you can like, you know, take care of business and, and get it out of there. So what I've noticed is the spirit, this spirit, um, I don't know what to call it. I'm just going to call it the religious spirit, the it's a shapeshifter. It, sh it changes shape. It's a spirit that tries to establish a form of godliness with no power, which is a mouthful. But what's it look like? It hates the prophets, because the prophets speak the truth. The real prophets, the ones that are speaking the true word of the Lord, it hates them. It hates the Holy Spirit and anything that has to do with the Holy Spirit. I know a lot of people came out of a church where Holy Spirit started moving, and they were like, nope, we don't want anything to do with that. <laughs> or they got a lot of flack for like operating just in the spirit or wanting to. They're like, no, nope, that's witchy. A lot of people came. I, I noticed a lot of people out here have come out of a culture like that, where they would just, you know, okay, I, I need to go somewhere where they have a paradigm for what the Spirit's doing. Mm -hmm. It classically will interrupt the flow of the Holy Spirit. Yes. I know all of you have seen that. I know all of you have. Like, it never fails. Like, it's the Spirit will be moving. You feel something, like, synergizing, and somebody will pop up. Something will pop up and, like, break that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, everyone's like, ah. Mm -hmm. And it always draws attention to themselves. Is it's trying to break that that connection. You'll see it in like if you're ever having a conversation with somebody and you're like, oh, I can feel like the Lord's doing something and you're ministering to somebody. Someone walks up out of the blue and just starts talking <laughs> and just like, Broom, like interrupts what you're doing. Like no regard to what you're saying, it's the same thing. I've seen it everywhere. I've seen it like as long as I've been a Christian, I've seen it. It's just really obvious to me. It likes attention. It'll grandstand. Pull all attention to itself, especially if the Holy Spirit's moving. Um... It likes to give people projects that seem important, like busy work. Uh, causes for people to strive for. It makes people strive for holiness. Uh, it's usually empowered by pride, and it can even look like a prophetic culture. Um, God. Help me articulate this. I, it, it really comes through a door of pride. I... A long time ago, like I think it was like 2009, the Lord told me, "Be careful, because the prophetic culture will start to look like what look like what tongues is now in the church where I was in, where everyone can just speak in tongues and fake it. Anyone can go. Blah, blah, blah. I could just make up any tongue right now. It doesn't mean that it's the Lord. It's easy to fake. Mm -hmm. The Lord told me, "Be careful, because the prophetic culture would come like that. Become like that. It's easy to give an encouraging word." You know, and you become a culture of just giving encouraging words, which is great. Encouraging words are great. It's the great, you know, foundational principles of, of the prophetic, finding the golden people in the encouraging word. The next step up is you can actually have gifts that are going to be from the Lord, and you can actually use those just to read people. You're not prophesying over them. You're not saying what the Lord says. You're just like, oh, I see that person's got a sick dog at home. <laughs> like, oh, you hear from the Lord. It's like, oh, they just have a gift. They can. That's a gift the Lord gave them, you know, that is getting information. It's not prophecy. And I think that's like a phase we're in right now. People are starting to realize, like, oh, okay, people have spiritual gifts. That doesn't mean they actually hear from the Lord. And it's like starting to clear up a lot of trouble that's been happening in the church. Because in my life, even when the Lord started unlocking me, I was a terrible person. <laughs> like, I, I was like just a monster. And like, I was moving like in the prophetic in our church because I had gifts. And people were like, this guy needs to be in leadership. And I just shred people. <laughs> like, I just tore them apart because I was angry. And I couldn't stand leadership, and I was hurt so bad by the church. I was just like, I, you've heard my story. But it's just immaturity within the, at that culture. It's like, oh, they're hearing from the Lord. They're getting accurate information. They must, the Lord, they must have the favor of the Lord on them. They need to be in a place of leadership. And so you put these people, I call myself a social tyrannosaurus. You put people like that in, in a place of leadership, and they just make a huge mess. 
Yeah. Yeah, of the mega huge mess. So where the problem comes in is like we're in this culture where there's a lot of things happening in the spirit. You see people getting unlocked. Like, oh wow, that person's moving in healing, and that person's getting amazing prophetic words, and that person's just got an anointing for the word, and this person's got. And it's like I need to catch up to that, and I need to start like acting and performing like that. And so you start like there's like a real like um, not a pressure, but like if you're insecure at all, or if you feel like you're not catching up, you're like I'm just gonna make something up. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like, oh yeah, we all have prophetic words today. And um, there's nothing wrong with that in a learning environment, right? If we're learning and practicing prophecy and, and that's... But when it becomes the culture of like, there's nothing manifest that's of the Lord. It's just a lot of like, mm, yeah, I hear him too. I've got a word as well. You see what I'm saying? Where that, that spirit can start to leech its way in and get a hold of that. And then that becomes the culture. That becomes the form of godliness with no power. It just becomes this thing where everyone's like, the Lord gave me a vision. I was in a, it was a while ago, and he was like, I was actually being, there was a whole bunch of people speaking in tongues in this church I was in. I was getting really annoyed in my spirit. I mean, this was back when I was like the social T-Rex too, so everything annoyed me. But this like really annoyed me, and I'm just like, oh, I hate this. Why do I hate this? And the Lord kept showing me like, that's the emperor, that's the emperor's new clothes. You know that, that parable? Where this guy come in and he sewed these pretend clothes and the emperor wore them around and everyone could see he was naked but no one would say anything. <laughs> Except one girl was like, you're naked! And all of a sudden everybody's like, yeah, he's naked! And so that was the same way. It's like, this is all fake. You know, no one's actually moving under the power of the spirit. And it's like, am I the only one that knows that? It's like, everyone's too afraid to say anything because it's the culture of godliness and no power. Prophecy can be like that as well. If we're not careful, it's not going to happen in here. But I feel that that's something that's trying to be established across this culture and as a board. Because like the prophetic is like a pop thing now. You know, it's a pop thing. It was fringe, but now it's like everyone, you know, everyone can prophesy, right? Um, so we got to be careful of that. And at the gateway is pride. If you're like, oh man, I need, to, I need to jump on board with that too. You know, it's like, oh, I do think my hips healed. Or, you know, and it's not. Yeah. Or like, uh, you know, like I do have a prophetic word. And it's like, everyone in here knows when a prophetic word is empty. It just drops to the floor, right? Everyone's like, hmm, nice try. Because we're a mature prophetic culture. It's like, good job, try next time. But you can see in an unhealthy way how that could get usher in that spirit, right? You guys tracking with me? Yes. All right. All right. Where are we at, Lord? I just chucked all around my notes. Okay, so this thing has been popping up all over the place. And I'm just going to give you, like, in my dreams, in the flesh, everywhere, like, you know, me and Amy get kind of similar prophetic feeds. Uh, the Lord speaks to us a lot about the same things, because we're both, like, operate kind of similar in this region. And it's been pretty uncanny, hasn't it? Like, well, she'll have a dream, and I'll have the same dream, and we'll see the same thing. And so, this thing has, like, been popping up everywhere for the last, what, four months? Probably longer than that. Julie's had dreams about it. You know, she's intercessor. And yeah, an intercessor knowing our life, and she's seen it in her dreams. And so, I'm just going to give you some examples of how this thing's popped up. Like, I only have a like, I have 11 different ways this has popped up in a dream for me. But I have like, that's not all of them. Like, I have a lot of them. <laughs> and some of them I can't, I won't share with you. They're just too like weird. Not weird. They're just like uncomfortable to share. But this is the way that this thing has popped up in my in my dream life. Just to give you an idea of what it looks like. All right, what it is. So, um, are you guys tracking with me? Yeah. Yes. Like all right. That horn you're going on the head. Okay. My yep. hair looks great. Thanks. I got to take it. Um, okay, so these are, the, these are the ways this has popped up in my dreams. Like, the Lord showed me this spirit of false prophecy, this form of godliness, no power. It's a spirit. I'm not sure, sure what to call it, but it's the same stupid spirit that just changed shape all the time. It pops up in other places. So the first thing the Lord showed me in a dream... He showed it, he represented it with sugar. And for me, sugar is a toxin. And the Lord was telling me that this thing's toxic. And sugar, as we know, feeds cancer, right? It looks like a cancer in the body. Um, the next thing the Lord did was tell me, like, point blank, he's like, get rid of Tim Burton. And I'm like, what? <laughs> in this dream. Get rid of Tim Burton. That's like my favorite director. But, like, I had to search that one out a little bit, and who was here? Somebody was here, and no, I had, we sat down, we prayed about it, and I think it was um, Jeanette that said, oh, uh, didn't he do the Headless Horseman? It's got that character Ichabod in it. Yeah. And what does Ichabod mean? 
The glory is departed. And it had those horsemen. That's a horseman with no head, no leader, right? They're running around. But I said, think about the other names of some of the movies he, he's directed. The Corpse Bride, The Nightmare Before Christmas, Edward Scissorhands is basically a movie, movie about the orphan and orphans. Like, all those things were like, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. It's, it's all those things. It's, it's the Corpse Bride. It's the glory of God departed. It's a nightmare before Christmas. It's an orphan spirit. The next thing he showed me in a dream was a, a little praying mantis with a big head and a big mouth and, and these little underdeveloped arms. And it was like, reaching out. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I know praying mantis is, mantis means prophet. That's a praying prophet. But it doesn't have a prayer life. Its arms are underdeveloped and it has no power. No prayer. It didn't have its arms weren't there. Right? No, no relationship with the Lord. The next thing he showed me was a black cat covered in mange and like blinded by its own filth. So I know you're thinking witchcraft spirit, which a black cat often is a witchcraft spirit, and that probably was in there because the Lord is just great at like using one thing to cover a lot of stuff. But it's it was poor, blind, and naked, basically. What is that? It represents Laodicea. You know the church of Laodicea? Uh, Revelation 3.17, Laodicea says, I am rich, I don't need anything, but you do not realize you are pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. There was some pride there. It You showed me a weak, sick, like underdeveloped man who just looked like a boy who was uh, naked and posting away on social media like he knew what he was doing. But he was surrounded by dog crap. <laughs> so this, this guy who was like super immature and underdeveloped, but he thought he was important and he was like just like spewing stuff on social media. Um, also an image of Laodicea, the church of Laodicea. Poor blind and naked, doesn't realize it. He's like, I need nothing. I've got all this, in, in, you know, <laughs> I got all this wisdom to post on Facebook. Um, a speaker that was invited to speak on the stage at a church that was an unhealthy looking burlesque dancer oh. and you know burlesque traditionally is a mockery or a parody of a real thing a parody of the mockery of the Holy Spirit I had a dream that I was watching this uh, I was sitting in an airport and this mother and this family come in and just looked like rock stars three kids looked like rock stars and the dad and the mom and she walked in the back room and she was going to feed them all and they all went in there, and when her husband came in, he came in, and all of a sudden he looked flabby, and he was like muttering scripture and religious nonsense. She's like, do you want something to eat? He's like, no, I don't need anything to eat. And he walked out. He wasn't hungry for the things of the Spirit. The mother represents the Holy Spirit. She's trying to feed him. This guy had a religious spirit. He didn't think he, he wasn't even hungry for the things of the Spirit. Didn't need it. Didn't realize what he looked like. The Lord showed me two cotton mouths hiding under, he showed me like hummingbirds sitting in a tree, it was like a really beautiful scene, and two cotton mouth snakes hiding in the leaves underneath them. So, cotton mouths have white mouths, they're, they're snakes, they're vipers, whitewashed sepulchers open graves, you know. Actually, the Lord gave me a double meaning on that one, because those, like, those were also two prophets guarding the, guarding the body with uh, pure mouths and wise as serpents, that had a flip meaning, the Lord gave me a double meaning for that one. Um, Really funny when he gave me an image of an alligator dressed in child's clothes falling off the back of a boat. I was like, I had to think about that one. <laughs> like, what? It's a territory, sp territorial spirit with a big mouth, thick skin, ambush predator, and it was immature. It's like this immature thing with a big mouth walking around, and it was falling off the back of the boat. It was getting left behind. Shapeshifter. I had this crazy dream about a shapeshifter coming to my house. Uh, in the end, after I got done meth, it just got done like tangling with me, and I was talking to it. It told me it lived in the water. It was that spirit, all those spirits, but it told me, yeah, I live in the water. The stream, the flow, where we're getting our life, the feed, is living in there, polluting the water. Brackish water, you know, salt water, fresh water in the same stream. It hides in the stream, you know. So those are just, a, those are just that's like 11 that I got in a very short amount of time. The Lord like, this is it, this is it, this is it, this is it, this is it. It's all the things it does. So it's like, it's out there, it's real. Amy got a whole bunch of different things. Um, she had a dream with like a bunch of lightning coming down. It was all bright colors that people are attracted to because they thought it was power, but it wasn't the Lord's power. It was just like a light show. And um, she told the last time she spoke, she had a, a false version of her son come in that looked just like him. And she, the only way she knew... Which one was which? Is she had a relationship with her son, and she seen the shapeshifter. She told me she had like this experience happen where this power source blew up her husband's computer. You know, see, I mean that's pretty self-explanatory, right? Like a false power source is going to blow up the whole system. Um, 
And that's just to name a few. I think, Julie, you had that one. You had a dream, like, earlier on, I think before I even had any of mine, of this, like, uh, really um, aggressive uh, woman cutting a guy's throat really deep in his mouth, like, silencing him. Wow. Yeah, really maliciously and, like, calculated. Yeah, so it's been that. That's all the stuff that's been going on behind the scenes with all the people that are intercessing, you know, interceding and, and the people that are carrying the prophetic gift that are, like, in the leadership right now. It's like, wow, that thing is out there and it's everywhere. And so it's a real thing. Like it's been affecting, it's been affecting the atmosphere. So we need to get rid of it. Um, I knew it was one. I know, it's so heavy. It's been really obnoxious. Like I don't like it when things show up in my in my bedroom. It makes me mad. And it's just like it just doesn't belong there. I'm trying to sleep. Um, so yeah, where are we? So I want to tell you a story about, you guys know the story. It's a really like, kind of like troubling, like story for a lot of people in scripture of Elijah and the bears, you know that scripture? Yeah. <laughs> so it's 2 Kings 2, 23, 25. It says, Elijah went up, um, from where he was to Bethel. And as he was going, uh, up by the way, 42 boys came out from the city and mocked him. And they said, go up, you bald head, go up, you bald head. And when he looked behind him and saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then two female bears came out of the woods and mauled all of them. And then he passed by there and went to Mount Carmel and then returned to Samaria. Weird story. <laughs> like, wow, that's pretty brutal. <laughs> right? But there is so much symbology in that story. So at first, Elijah was heading to a city called Bethel. Remember what they put in Bethel? One of the golden calves. So Bethel was like knee deep in worshiping the false. They had a form of godliness with no power there. It was like in their culture. And here's God's true representative coming up to the city. And so literally people came out of the city to meet him. It says a mob of youth came out to hurl insults on him. And that that thing they said to him, go on up you bald head, it wasn't, didn't mean he was actually bald, it was a common insult back then to call people bald head because it meant they were a leper. Because the lepers shaved their heads, it was a sign they were a leper. So basically what they're saying is, go on up, like Elijah did, go on up you leper, we want you to die, is basically what they were saying, don't come around here. Um, the false hates the real, right? And they were coming out because they didn't want him in, this, in their city. Um, so he cursed them, two female bears came out of the woods and mauled them. Which seems pretty, it is brutal, like, it's, you know, like, he'll have a theory, like a mother bear, right? We use that as a symbol for, like, a mother's theory, right? It's really interesting that I got led back just by accident to Leviticus 26, where there's actually a curse in Leviticus 26, that if you're hostile toward the Lord, that uh, the Lord will let wild beasts uh, loose against you, which will bereave you of your children, destroy your livestock, and make you so few in number that your roads will be deserted. Wow. So they actually, they just invoked that curse on themselves by going up and being hostile towards the Lord's anointing. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. Yeah, and so he passed by and went to Mount Carmel. Um, wild. Pretty wild. So, you know, there's still, princes, there's still, still spiritual principles at that, uh, in effect today like that, you know. And so, you know, it's funny, in my dreams, bears are always death. <laughs> Like, when I see God's representative dream, it's a bear. It always has been. So I think that is really fascinating. So, but in the present day, if you think about it, what happens to a church that or a, a group that's given over to a spirit that establishes a form of godliness with no power? Like, eventually they become hostile to the Holy Spirit and the things mm -hmm. of the Lord, right? And you all have been in, like, I don't know if you all have, but I've been in, like, church environments where they're just hostile to the things of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. um, but literally, in the Spirit... That actually opens up, that opens up a principle. They're hostile to the things of the Lord. It just opens up a door for the beasts to come against them, the ones that still kill and destroy, right? Mm -hmm. So you ever like notice like a lot of churches or like a lot of groups, they're like trying to do stuff like it, but they're all sick or they're all injured or they're all hurt. And there's like a lot of disasters going on in that body. Mm -hmm. Harsh reality. Harsh reality. So pretty wild. You want to partner with that? I know this is heavy. But good news, we don't have to. So, 
I really feel like the Lord wanted me to release all that, wanted to lay all that out for you so you knew what's kind of going on in the Spirit. I know a lot of you have felt that, like, what's going on? I feel something weird's going on. There's literally been, there's literally been like this agenda, this thing in this region that's trying to keep, that's trying to keep establishing that. A false move of the Holy Spirit, a uh, religious spirit is around, and religious spirit looks like a lot of different things. It doesn't necessarily mean it looks like a conservative movement, you know. Um, it just looks like something that enslaves people to a formula or rules or a system or a whatever else. And it's, it's really slippery and it shifts and moves around, um, but it, you can see it. You know, If you know the real thing, you can see it. And I really think what the Lord's doing is, um, it's like, you remember Chris's word about the Cairo season mm-hmm. that's coming up? It's like just a great word about yes. you know, the Lord just accelerating and blessing and all the receiving. In this season, um, that's amazing. Like, I can't wait for that. But it's like that, that work can actually be sabotaged by that spirit, the form of godliness with no power, you know, that work. And um, we're not going to let that happen. So how do we not let that happen? I have, I have a few things for you. I'm kind of making some clock back here. So the first thing we, that I have that came to mind is, like, we just really need to lead with love. Because if we're leading with love, that thing's not going to go anywhere. That, that it, it operates uh, and you know, it comes through doors that are of damaged, you know, damaged places in our lives. Hate, anger, pride, fear, all those things. Um, John 4, 7 says, We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. That is how we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of deception. Beloved, let us love one another because love comes from God and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. God is love. I mean, it's always like, it's always like the, the default setting for me. It's like, I just, I don't know what to do. I'm just going to operate in love. You know, it's, you can't fail if you operate in love, right? That's right. The other thing we need to make sure we're doing is constantly developing our relationship with the person of God, our Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yes. The person of God, not the idea of God. Yes. You know, we, God is all about personal relationship and connection. I mean, Way back from Mount Sinai, his goal is like, come on, I want to be your God, and you can be my people, and I will talk right to you. And they're like, well, you don't really want to talk to you face to face, you're terrifying, why don't you talk to him for us? <laughs> it's like the curse of the prophet, like forever, it's like people want you to be and go between, and you're like, your job's like, no, I need to connect you to God. And like, we don't want to put all that effort into it, we want you to tell us what's going on. Get a word for me. I'm not a psychic. Yeah, what's the word for me today? Are you going this me? You know, prophet, you get in a prophetic culture, they all do that to you. It's annoying. Not all of them, but it's like, I know you got a word for me, but I, do. I will tell you if I do. And you make something up. I see you buying me coffee in five minutes. So I will paint off yes. my house. Right. No, but we need to, like, put some effort into it. I mean, this isn't a drive-up window thing. This isn't an American mindset, you know, where you're like, oh, we want it now, we want it all, we want it, big, we want it bigger. Um, we need to put some effort into developing our relationship with the Lord. Um, it takes pursuing on our part. You remember, like, Joe, Joe, uh, Jeroboam's advertising campaign? It's like, it is so far. You don't want to go all that distance to, to go worship the Lord. You can just worship him right here in this thing I made. <laughs> you know, this poor replica of God's throne, you know, it's like, we can form a religion, and we have programs, and you know, you can you know, spend all your free time volunteering you know, at the bake sale and all that stuff. You know, it's like it feels like you're doing something godly, <clears throat> you know, but there's no relationship. There's no relationship. Um, I kind of get irritated with people. I've had people like, you know, I'm not going to all that concert, driving all that, or that conference, driving all that way because the same Holy Spirit's here is there, and I won't get anything there. I can't get here. And like you have no idea what you're saying, you know. That's right. There's some, there's some, there's something to the journey of going to where the Lord is, putting effort into like spending yeah. your resources, taking your time, <coughs> putting putting effort into pursuing the Lord mm-hmm. with all your heart, even if it costs you, it's uncomfortable, you don't have time for it. It's funny because for me, it's not always about what I get at like a conference or, or somewhere where I think the Lord's doing something. It's usually on the journey to get there yeah, that's right. that I get something where the Lord starts showing up. Um, so putting effort into forming a relationship with the Lord. The Lord is very relational. I mean, he's very relational. And it's going to, you know, you'll develop an ear for the Lord's voice, you know. And so when that false thing comes in and tries to, like, 
You get you under a spell. You're like, who are you? Okay. It's the scariest verse in the Bible for me. As many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name? And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. That freaks me out. That verse freaks me out. In a good way. In a good way. Because it's like, it goes back to the gifts thing. Just because you can read somebody doesn't mean you're in the Lord, right? It's like, congratulations, you know. You don't know me. Um... And really let God be seated in the throne of our heart. You know, don't try to make him sit on stuff we form with our hands. You know, and that's the scary thing because, man, Mike Michero's message. Who was here for Mike Michero? Oh, so awesome. that amazing? Awesome. Oh, man. If anyone who didn't, wasn't here, they didn't listen to that. <clears throat> Letting the spirit of truth come in and reside in your heart. And just like allowing truth to be, you know, just allowing yourself to accept the truth. I think that's amazing. I love this message. I, I, I just want to listen to it again because I, I need to like get that verbiage down the way you describe it. But having the Lord like sit in the throne of your heart where he wants to sit will cost you because he's an all-consuming fire, right? And so if there's anything in there that like isn't pure, it's going to get burned out. And it's a painful process. And he doesn't do it all at once. You know, he does it in stages. He does, he does what we can handle. Uh, but it changes you. Like I'm a completely different person than I was eight years ago. Most of you probably wouldn't like me, and I wouldn't like you. <laughs> I wouldn't even come in the room like this. I couldn't actually because I couldn't be around people like this with their focus on me. Um, but I had a prayer. Like I know I need to be transformed, Lord. I know I, I want you in my heart. I want you in my life. I, I don't even understand. I don't even know what that looks like or what you're going to turn me into. It freaks me out. But I just need you to just start the process. And he did. He just continually was like gently, like, all right, I'm going through this. Some of it wasn't gentle. Some of it was like, <laughs> I don't know what's happening to me. Screaming and rolling around the floor. Um, not uh, but it's But it'll cost you. It'll cost you things you want to hang on to sometimes. You know? And that will change you. It'll change you into the person that God originally designed you to be. It's like you don't even know what that is. You don't even know what that is because we've incurred all this damage. So it used to scare me. I was like, uh, you know, Saul has changed into a different man when he got in the company of prophets. That freaked me out. I'm like, I don't want to change into somebody else. I like who I am. You know, it's like, you don't understand. You, you changed into the person that I created you to be in the first place. <clears throat> um, and it's hard, you know, it's hard. It's hard to do that. We'd rather, like, put Lord somewhere where we can, like, come and see him. Worship him and sing the songs. I'm like, look, God, we made a box for you. Will you come and sit in this box for me? You know? So we can get there on whatever and we can enjoy all the stuff and then stay the same. He doesn't want to do that. And I really feel like the Lord is um, been speaking a lot about waiting on him. And um, it's hard for you, like, people like of action. But it takes a humility to wait on the Lord. Sometimes I think the Lord just doesn't move because he's like, you know, we're like, Lord, ah, and he's just like, we're going forward. And he just w makes you wait for the sake of making you wait because he's like, I'm God. I don't have to do what you say. I'm God. I'm lived forever. I'm, I've been here forever, you know? It's like, when are you going to settle down and quit running around with your hair on fire? <laughs> are you done yet? Are you done? Okay. Now oh, we can do something. Let's do that. He's waiting for you to wear yourself out. <laughs> You know, and waiting on the Lord can look like a lot of things. It can look like, it's, it's, humi it's, it's humbling, you know. Like, I've been in a season where, like, I, but, uh, it's like, Lord's not telling me to do anything. I had all these things I wanted to do, and it's like, I don't have favor to do any of them. I'm like, oh, I can't do that, that, that. Okay, I'm going to sit here, you know. And, um, but in that time, you know, you kind of have to steward what the Lord's already given you. You know, the Lord sometimes will, you know, like, give you a word or, you know, give you a dream, or give you this, or give you that, or give you something to do, or something he's told you to do that you're not doing, and that's, that's the season to, like, just wait on the Lord, and, like, do those things. Um, there's always a temptation, though, to, like, ah, oh, we're going to build this thing, you know, and with good intention, and, and it's not the Lord's idea, but we want the more, so we're going to, like, we're going to go after this thing, you know, and we want to establish, like, a church building. You know, and I always think it's funny that Epic, as long as I've, I've been to Epic on day one, like I was there at Ground Zero, as long as we've been doing Epic, the Holy Spirit has had very little to say about a church building, or about growing, or about expanding, it never has like given us any direction at all, just like, oh, we feel like we should, 
do what? I don't know. It's like, why burn something that's broken? You know, why, why fix something that's not broken, you know? It's really funny. I'm like, I just think it's funny. I mean, all the time, you know, I used to call this a refugee camp for people escaping the religious system. So people like, what is epic? That's what I would say. It's a refugee camp for people escaping the religious system. It's like the golden calf religion. They've come out of it, but they're like, they get here and they're like, I like this place. Yeah. It needs to be bigger. And we need like communion cups and, and maybe, the pro- maybe we need Sunday school and a youth group. And I think we need a building. Let's, let's make a huge building. And, you know, we're like, we don't want to run a huge church. This is not what this is. I think the Lord's doing something literally different. Yeah. You know, different than you've seen. You know, the Lord has left the building, right? It's like, that's when I left the church. The Lord kept telling me for like a month, Elvis has left the building. And I'm like, I don't know why you keep telling me that. And then it hit me. It's like, oh, you're leaving the building. I get it. Very funny. Very funny. Very funny. Very funny. Yes. Not that Epic's not going to grow, but I feel like that we're in this stage, we're like, oh yeah, like God's moving, and Mike Michero asked him, so what do you feel like Epic feels like? He's like, it feels like there's all this spiritual energy, like this stuff being channeled through this tiny space and diffused into the, the region. I'm like, that's exactly what it is. It's like, is it, does it mean that it's broken? <laughs> does it mean that it needs to be a bigger keyhole? <laughs> it just means that's where it's coming, you know? But we were like, oh, I to do something. Godly. Instead of like, what are you saying, Lord? Right? I, Epic moves. Epic's in everybody. Should, the Epic is mobile. It walks around. You know, it's got an eyes and a mouth, and feet. And God goes where you go. Right? It's a family. Um, not that we won't change or grow or who knows what, but I just think it's funny. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. My God, in you I trust. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without cause will be ashamed. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I will wait all day. We don't want to start making invisible clothes and parading around and pretending like... (laughs) The Lord's doing something he's not, right? That's just embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Okay, I'm almost wrapping up here. Um, this has been pretty scattered, I'm sorry. It's a lot of information for me to try to like pack into something and glue it to you, but As far as the prophetic goes, and like things of the spirit, and operating the spirit, and I think an attitude of humility is required. I was saying, I was thinking there, it's like don't fake it until you make it, because you can't. You can't make it because you won't fake it with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you just can't. I mean, um, you only establish this culture of, of a form of godliness with no power. Um, and I'm not talking about like practicing the prophetic. We, it's the, the the learning time where we practice and this and that. But we need to develop. We need to grow. Like the, we need to like develop it. We need to challenge ourselves. We need to see evidence that the Lord is with us in that and like grow in our gifts in the areas of favor. Um, um, I, sometimes I think this culture gets stuck in the like, okay, we're finding gold in everybody and giving the encouraging word. But there's way the prophetic is so much more than that. That is like the core heart of the prophetic is, is you know, saying what the Lord's saying over people's lives. But it's a big, it's a big world out there. Um, have purity in your stream, you know. Don't be mixing the salt water with the fresh water. Um, don't use Holy Spirit as, a, Spirit as a scapegoat for your own ideas. <laughs> like the Holy Spirit's not the best version of you. It's like we're good, but we're not that good. And I think a lot of people think that the Holy Spirit's voice is like the best version of themselves. <laughs> like, you know, and it's, I don't know, personally, when the Holy Spirit talks to me, it's like, okay, that's not me, you know, it's, I couldn't think that up, I'm not that smart, you know, mm-hmm. or I'm not that profound, or it's like, that just came out of nowhere, and I just am like learning from what I'm saying, you know, um, and there's this mindset of <clears throat> disbelief and, and, and disillusion that I think that sometimes helps establish that form of godliness with no power, um, and fear and pride, and wanting to be catch up, like, to catch up to the, the culture, and just feeling like you got to perform, and, and it all opens doors for that stuff to come in and like take a seat and root and get in there and and 
and develop that culture. So, And lastly, we need to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Um, it says the time is coming now when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such as these to worship him. He says God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Just like the simple act of being truthful with yourself is so powerful. Like, you know, uh, I had to walk through that in my early days of trying to like steward the prophetic. I think that God called me to more of a, you know, a prophetic office. And I had so much pressure to give prophetic words all the time. Like, I literally had a time in here years ago where like it would get quiet and everyone would turn around and look at me. <laughs> like, and I'd be like, you know, and I shut down. I'm like, I am not playing that game at all. And I had a lot of stuff to say. But I knew better. I'm like, I am not doing that. I am not caving to your pressure at all. I will go out of my way not to have a prophetic word just so I never feel the pressure to perform in that environment. Mm -hmm. And I, the Lord honored that in my life. And even today, I'm like, sometimes I'm like, this is a really trippy word, you know. It's like, I haven't given a word in a while, but I really feel like the Lord really wants me to release something. I will ask for the Lord specifically to tell somebody. Like, have them turn around and say, yeah, this one's got a word, and it now almost never fails, it always happens, um, so, there's just a humility that comes with it, and, and uh, you know, waiting on the Lord, it's like, this is the Lord's gig, you know, <laughs> so we get a partner with it, and it's like, you gotta ask yourself, what's our motivation for, like, operating in the spirit, and what's our motivation for wanting more, and the gift of prophecy, and all this stuff, it's like, is it to grow the kingdom, or to look rad, you know, <laughs> Or is it just because it's fun and entertaining, or are we really trying to do the work of the Lord? You know? And um, I'm constantly checking my heart with that stuff, you know. So I love the prophetic. I love the spirit realm. I love when things get weird. <laughs> you know, it's just like, ah, oh, yeah, it's so cool. Um, so that's about that. Hopefully I didn't lose you on all that. I know it was a lot. But I really feel like right, like right now, I feel like last season was like a sifting and a and, and just a really hard season for a lot of people. And it's like, I really felt like last season, people, the Lord was looking for those people that were deeply rooted in Jesus that wouldn't blow over in the wind. You know, and I feel like those people are kind of the people right now, they're like, you know, we made it. And the Lord's ready to release um, some great things in this next season. But I think the warning for this next season is to watch out for that spirit, that form of godliness with no power, because it will come in like a slippery little weasel and get in in the weirdest places, and, and just to ask the Lord for wisdom in that, and like where you can see it, and even in your own life, like, all right, nope, this is not what the Lord's doing, it's like, I don't need to perform, I don't need to do anything, I don't need to be anybody, I just need to hear the Lord's voice, and I want to do what you're doing, because Jesus only did what the Father was doing, we saw the Father doing, Holy Spirit only says what the Father's saying, like, who are we to go out and, like, do a bunch of other stuff, right, so... That's really it. I mean, that's, I always tell people, like, look, it's all about relationship with the Holy Spirit. Like, well, why don't we hear the Holy Spirit? Well, how much time do you spend? Like, going after the Holy Spirit. Well, you know, after I watch TV, I stumble into the prayer closet for five minutes. Like, I don't hear anything. You know? It's like, God doesn't hear me. It's like, well, what do you got going on in your life? Well, you know, it's like, I do beat my kids. It's like, well, okay. Uh, maybe you should probably stop doing that. The Holy Spirit might talk to you, you know? You know what I mean? It's funny. It's like that. You know, it's like I don't want to change anything. I want to be mean and cruel and evil, and, and I still think the Lord should talk to me. Not that everybody is, but in my own life, I was just mean. I was like, I don't know why the Holy Spirit talked to me as much as you know. I, I, I don't know why the Lord talked to me as much as He did. You know? I was so mean, <laughs> but I knew He saw something in my life. He's like, all right, we're gonna take this monster and turn him into something. But um, you know, we. we it, the forming the relationship with the Lord, the person of the Lord is what the Lord's heart is, you know, and um, I know that's where the key to success is in all of this, so. Anyway, let me pray over you guys, and then we release, and I gotta go home and pack up, because I gotta hit the ready. Yeah, so, anyway, all right. So, Lord, I just uh, pray over this group, so I didn't confuse them too much, but I just pray that you would sharpen their minds, sharpen their eyes, sharpen their ears, sharpen their discernment, Lord God, so they can see um, this any spirit that would come in and try to establish a form of godliness with no power, Lord God, because we don't want that. We want, we only want you, Lord God. We want the real. We want the real Holy Spirit to be seated in our hearts. We want the Father to be seated in our heart. Jesus, we want you seated in our hearts, not in something we made with our hands, Lord God. Not something we made with our good intentions, Lord God. 
we don't want to do stuff just for the sake of doing it. So we feel like we're doing godly things, Lord God. We want to do what you're doing. We want to serve your son, Lord God. So I just release that over everyone here tonight, Lord God. And we just send them out with a blessing. And we just thank you for this time tonight. And we pray to you in Jesus' name. starting a school. It's official. So exciting. The official start date is August 18th. No, I'm sorry, not August, August. September 18th. Thank you. Not August 18th. No, no. September 18th. So after our kids get back in school and all that business. So, and we'll be having our website up hopefully soon. Um, we're having a little trouble getting it. All the logistics of it, but we have everything. So the, we're going to have an ESSM, a BSSM here. At, it's, we're calling it ESSM for EPIC. So. What's it stand for? Somebody doesn't know. It stands for EPIC Supernatural School of Ministry. Good question. It won't be the same, though. No, it's not going to be like that, though. We have it, we're, our team, we're making it for Central Oregon. 